Hi everyone, I just wanted to record this video in response to our uh, Sasor readings and our lecture and stuff like that. As I was perusing my, my second reading of the uh, Sasor assignment there, the, uh, the from course in uh, general linguistics, I realized I had to stop because I have so many ideas I want to talk about and I thought I have four at least and I'd like to get them out there so we can discuss them in the forums. Um, looking forward to reading all those and seeing those as well. All right, um, so Sasor so semenology and its relationship to structuralism, for me, seems to fall apart to post-structuralism when we get into associative relationships. So in the actual texts, uh, Sasur talks about three different types of associative relationships. So there's the visual, which comes from words resembling one another, either through prefix or suffix. There is the analogy of concept, which is the idea that when you say the word school or say the word school written, you'll associate it with rulers, desks, or the kid that used to pick their nose next to you in class, something like that. And there's also the phonetic. So that's obviously with words that rhyme with one another and stuff like that. So my problem there, and I think where this kind of structuralist system turns to something that could be considered subjective and post-structuralist is when we start looking at the analogy of concepts. So when we think about analogy of concepts beyond just, you know, your school, ruler, and desk, that last image I mentioned is very much related to your own subjective experience. So two examples I kind of thought of related to that would be the idea of clowns. Um, there is a general social leaning towards finding clowns terrifying now, but in the past they were very well loved. You know, there were a reason people invited clowns to their parties. They were funny. They looked kind of different with their big noses and their feet. It was, it was entertaining. But now we find it terrifying. So was there an experiential change there? Or what made that association with the concept of clowns different? And yeah, I think it's related to experience. My second kind of image with that is a bit more ridiculous, but let's say you are walking by a aquarium and there's some dolphin shows going on. You can't really see the dolphins, you're just kind of walking around, you know, with, with your, with your lover, let's say. So out of nowhere, something goes wrong with the dolphin show and a dolphin projectiles out of the aquarium lands, crushes your partner, and kills them. Sad days. You are not going to view the term dolphin or aquarium with the same kind of connection that you did before, or that someone who hadn't lost a significant other to a dolphin would have, right? So, so, so here we find that subjective experience seems to be kind of getting in the way of uh, Sassur's attempts to structurally define what the associations of this word are. What is it relationship to the larger system at hand? Um, what are my next ones I got here? Right, so the idea of signification and value. I think a few people were discussing that in the chat, and I'm looking forward to, to taking a look at those. So what would this mean for someone who's bilingual? So looking at signification, signification is... As, as the kind of, you know, concept in the book expresses, can be two different words that represent the same concept. So, sheep and moutin in French, I'm probably butcherizing that pronunciation, have the same general concept they associate to. It's their signification. But the value of those units within the closed system of language, um, actually, Sussur defines it as the value of any term is determined by its environment within a closed system. That kind of gets thrown out the window if you're a bilingual speaker. So the example Sassur uses is the word mouton and mutton in English. So mouton is the French word for sheep, and English has kind of adopted that just through our you know beautiful bastardized history of the English language um, to the word mutton, which means meat. You know, it means is the meat of the sheep, I believe. So when you hear the word mouton in your closed system of language, you associate that with mutton and then meat. So the concept it's originally like representing is gone. It's entirely changed, right? Its value is different within your closed system. So if you grow up speaking English and French equally, how many words are going to have strange systems that go beyond the closed system of one language or the other? Is this closed system just within your head? And what does this mean generally for bilingual speakers? I don't know. I'm throwing that out there. So the other one I have here that I found quite confusing um, is the idea of 
without language, thought is a vague, uncharted nebula. So the idea that I'm navigating the world and I can't pick up my coffee mug um, or, or recognize it as something different and drink from it somewhat without knowing the word for coffee mug or that, or at least I wouldn't have a concept of it. It would just be some general visual stimuli in my surroundings. So the essential idea behind that is that there's no pre-existing ideas within our heads. But I struggle with that because that seems to ignore affect and emotion that guides our behavior in a very basic, impulsive way. So let me get that further. So can we truly say that it is language that gives us the capacity for emotions. Do I need to have a word for happiness or sadness or sorrow or whatever? Do I need that to be able to feel it? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think having the basic idea of happiness changes how happiness feels to us on a very, you know, almost biological level. So again, I go back to like Dr. Ross mentions the quote uh, in the lecture, if you can't articulate it, it is not knowledge. But how many times in our lives have we felt something on an emotional level that we can't put into words? I think of, and obviously I don't speak German, but there are many words in German and the Japanese language that represent emotional states that yes, we can feel, but we don't have a word for. Like the idea of looking at a crowd and being very aware all of a sudden that everyone is their own individual having their own life experience or the idea like the smell of rain or something like that. We don't have words for these things, but we can still feel the emotional response they elicit. So this has probably gone longer than I should have, but I'm really excited about these readings and I hope and look forward to reading all your responses in the comments. Thanks a lot.